Good evening, Chair Aaron, members of the Development Review Commission, Scott Siegel, Planning and Building Services Director. Uh, this evening, thank you for setting aside time for the training on historic preservation planning and code administration. Um, we've pulled together uh, this training with really two purposes in mind. Uh, one is that uh, historic preservation requirements in the code are not widely known and they're not um, routinely applied because the applications that come forward that uh, would require historic review are fairly infrequent. So it occurred to us that with staff, um, as we've updated our historic profile um, sheets and records for the properties that are designated as landmarks, that because these projects happen so infrequently, when they do happen, uh, there's a learning curve. We Even at, at the staff level, we're rereading the code, we're getting reacquainted with it. Uh, we work regularly with the Historic Resources Advisory Board. They're uh, an excellent extension of, of the work that we do, and we do rely on their, on their input when we're reviewing applications for uh, primarily landmark alterations, and I think that's mostly what uh, you'll be hearing about tonight. But we wanted to have someone um, who's an expert in the field come and, and speak with you about uh, kind of from the high level um, of historic preservation planning and policy uh, down to the nuts and bolts of how uh, preservation works in our code day to day. So uh, before I introduce Kristen Miner, who's, who's joined us this evening, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context. Um, the city began his with historic preservation planning early on, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, the first inventory work was performed in the mid-1970s. Um, this was well before the state of Oregon um, and the Land Conservation and Development Commission had adopted administrative rules requiring local governments to adopt historic preservation or historic resource, historic and cultural resource elements into their comprehensive plans. Um, that came about in 1981 from the state. And in 1988, um, the city, city and a, a great number of volunteers did a much more comprehensive inventory of the structures, the landmarks in the community, and I believe there were approximately 200 um, landmarks or properties that were evaluated, and close to 100 were determined to be significant or potentially significant. Um, that was in 1988, and then in 1990, the city adopted its first historic preservation ordinance. And it hasn't changed a whole lot since then. Uh, there have been updates. At one point, the city had an historic uh, resources commission that reviewed um, applications for landmark alterations and so forth. Um, since then, it's, it's changed, and uh, those responsibilities have been consolidated um, be, or delegated to either staff or the Development Review Commission as um, applications are either referred to the DRC or appealed, and, and then they come before you. So. Uh, that's kind of a quick fast forward, but it only leaves us in 1994, so we're working with a code that you know, dates back pretty far. Um, and Kristen Miner, who's joining us this evening, I'll introduce. Um, Kristen is a specialist. She, this is what she does every day. Um, she has over 15, 16 years of experience working um, for local governments and other agencies. Uh, we actually worked together in the late 2000s on an historic preservation plan for Oregon State University that resulted in, in her firm was the lead. Uh, Peter Meijer Architects led that project and it resulted in uh, a, a National Historic District uh, designation for the campus, which is quite remarkable. Um, she's also worked with Portland Public Schools, the Portland Water Bureau, um, the City of Olympia. Uh, she's been all over the Portland region working on uh, really everything from uh, assessments to you know comprehensive preservation planning um, and individual buildings. Uh, there's a nomination for um, Memorial Coliseum National Register nomination. So really covering the spectrum of uh, buildings from our earliest historic buildings in Oregon to you know some fairly uh, contemporary examples. So with that, I wanted to introduce Kristen. Uh, she'll be presenting to you this evening. And uh, also have some staff here who are great resources and um, this evening and even after um, tonight, you're, I would encourage you to reach out and contact any of the folks here. Um, Paul Espy to my, to my left is our historic um, preservation planner. Um, he was the lead on the updates that the city completed recently to, I don't know, 70 or 80. That was a 
a large number of properties that, uh, and Peter Meijer Architects, Kristen's firm, uh, led that work, updating all the profile sheets for our landmarks in the city. Um, so Paul's here. Uh, we have some esteemed members of the Planning Commission and Historic Resources Advisory Board here this evening. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Kristen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Is this, this is on? Yes. Okay, terrific. Um, that was a thorough introduction. That was very nice. Um, I will uh, point out a few other things about my background. Um, I currently am the vice chair of the Portland Landmarks Commission, so I certainly know what it is to be in your shoes. Um, but I've also done a long stint at the city of Portland, so I feel very comfortable here at the staff table. Um, I spent 10 years being um, staff for both the Landmarks Commission and the Design Commission in Portland uh, before I left the city and um, went back into the private sector. So uh, tonight's training is exciting for me. I hope that you find it interesting as well as educational. And um, please do feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, or we can just cover questions at the end, whatever works for you. Um, so I am going to jump into the city code and why the city is involved in preservation in the first place. So why is regulation important? I called out a couple of really nice phrases and words from the code that I wanted to walk you through. And, that, and it starts with promote the welfare of the public. Um, that's something you're gonna see come up again and again in tonight's presentation. However, also protect owners against extraordinary cost. That's also a very important concept. Resolve conflicts between preservation and conflicting uses. Provide clear procedures and standards. Foster pride. Carry out provisions of statewide and comprehensive plan policies. Enhance property values. Financial benefits to the city, perhaps. Encourage knowledge create a sense of identity for the city, uh, preserve diverse styles, and encourage complementary design, recognize the importance of Oswego Lake, that's specifically called out, and then strengthen the economy. So we're gonna hear some of these themes echoing in some other code concepts that I'll be diving into further tonight. Now, the first thing I wanted to start with is really what is a resource? Um, historic resources can be a building, a site, a district, or an object. And these images that you're seeing in front of you are all um, Lake Oswego historic resources. Um, on the top left, of course, is a building. That's the Didzun House. On the top right is a cemetery, which is kind of both a site and a collection of objects. Um, on the lower left is the Tualatin Oswego Canal. So that's kind of an object, but also a site. And I will point out that some of these, it becomes tricky because there can be multiple properties and multiple owners that you have to consider. And then on the lower right is a building on the Merrillhurst campus, which is not a district. Actually, Lake Oswego uh, at this point does not have a historic district, but it's eligible to be a district. So at some point, you might have to think about a resource being a whole district of buildings. Now, Lake Oswego has, as uh, Scott mentioned, a landmarks designation list, and there are currently 72 properties on it. Um, the, the properties can be taken off or added to that list, depending on what happens with them. Um, 17 of those are listed on the National Register. And um, 
the code treats these resources nearly the same. Um, so when you're looking at alterations, the code criteria has a couple of big concepts. One of them is that change won't diminish the significance of the resource. So I'm going to come back to significance and what that really is. Another big concept is, OK, if it will diminish the significance, that might be OK if the benefits of the change outweigh the benefits of preservation. So for that one, I'm kind of calling it the on balance concept. And you already saw a little bit of that in just the, the, the reasons for doing preservation in the first place when they talked about protecting owners from onerous costs, but then also creating that public benefit. So there's going to be a lot of weighing that your decision making will entail. Now. Um, there are additional approval criteria that apply to any resource. And those, again, this, this kind of topmost square on the right is talking about additional on balance language. So it uses phrases like uh, the public interest or that alterations might be allowed, again, if the benefit to the community is higher um, than, the, than it is for preserving that resource. And I'll get back to that again. So we're going to talk about that balancing act. Um, another important consideration is the physical condition of the resource. So I'll spend a, a slide talking about that. And then finally, there's a whole list of these sub-criteria, one through nine. And I'm going to have a slide for each of these. So they range from original construction to windows to signs and lighting. So we'll cover each of those topics. So first, I'm going to cover some of these big concepts. And the first one really is, what is the historical or architectural significance of a resource? Now, that's really saying, why is it important? And there are ways that we can kind of divide significance into categories. Um, the major categories are used by the National Register, but they can also be useful for properties that aren't on the National Register, that just have local significance. And those are um, categories kind of A through D, as they're referred to. So the first one is really resources that are important in the development of some important aspect of a community. <laughs> What I'm showing you on the upper left is um, it's the uh, Hunt Club, the Lake Oswego Hunt Club, which is a resource that's important in the development of sports and entertainment in Lake Oswego. So I might have shown you another resource that was important in, say, the development of medicine or another kind of thematic um, or event-based um, uh, reason for its importance. The next category is category B, association with an important person. And what I'm showing you on the upper right is the Piddock Mansion in Portland. Um, it's important po partly because of the people who had that resource built. So that was Henry and Georgiana Piddock, who were very important in Portland's development, um, not only for railroads and banking and, well, you name it. They were incredibly important in Portland's early history. So even if the Piddock Mansion had been a much more modest resource, as the place where they lived, this would have qualified under criterion B. Now, the next one is architecturally significant. And what I'm showing you on the uh, lower left is um, John Yon's Visitor Information Center, also in Portland. Um, now, that is a much more modern resource, but it is still definitely architecturally significant. 
And finally, criterion B is archaeologically significant. And um, I know it just looks like kind of a bunch of rocks here, but what I'm showing you on the lower right is the entrance to an archaeological site in south central Oregon called Paisley Caves. Um, and there has been evidence of human occupation there for some 14,500 years. So that is a very archaeologically significant resource for our state. Now, in addition to these kind of categories of significance, we can also talk about the levels of significance for any individual resource. And that might be, as I did mention, some resources are on the National Register. Those would have a, a somewhat higher level of significance. And then uh, a resource might be locally significant to Lake Oswego, or it might be in between at the state level. Now here's the other very big concept that I wanted to talk about tonight, and that's really the concept of weighing a decision, um, you know, making the balance decision. <laughs> the purpose of historic regulations had terms in it like public interest, welfare of the public, and community benefit. On the other side is protecting owners against extraordinary cost. These both have to be factored in, <coughs> but the code is pretty clear that community interests should outweigh uh, the individual interests. That doesn't mean that any owner should be stuck with excessive costs, but that you do have to weigh the impact of what the owner wants to do with their resource. So what helps you? What can help you determine the public interest and what's important to the community? One of those would be the use of a resource. So an example that I'll give you is um, if somebody owns a private home, that is probably of less significance to the overall community than something that might have a somewhat more civic use. So it can just be um, weighted that way. Um, it can also be something that is a very rare example of its style or type. And you're probably going to know that because of the background information that comes to you about the resource. These are always going to be real people in front of you. And I'm sure that all of you have experience making difficult choices. You're going to hear stories about granny needing to sell or demolish her property in order to sell it, and that she really hasn't had the money to upkeep this resource, even though it's historic. Um, and then a developer who promises to construct affordable housing. So you need to have the evidence to understand and really make appropriate decisions about these claims in order to weigh what's important to the community. The next concept I'll talk briefly about is the physical condition of the resource you want to know something about the physical condition of the resource. And that is different than the integrity of the resource. So the integri integrity can be present even when a resource is in terrible condition. So I'm showing you a photograph of a barn. Um, this is out somewhere in Wasco County, I believe, actually, on the lower left. So this is an example of um, a resource that is in terrible condition, but still has its integrity. So it, integrity is really whether a resource still has its original design, materials, its original setting, and its original use. The, the upper two images are actually of the same resource <laughs> in Lake Oswego. 
but you would probably never know that <laughs> unless you knew a little bit about this resource. Um, this is the um, M.E. Church, which I'm blanking on. I think it's the Methodist Episcopalian, thank you, Methodist Episcopalian Church. Originally, it looked like the image on the right, on the upper right. Um, later in its history, it was moved from its existing site, and, or moved from its original site um, to where it is now. And the style and almost everything about this resource was changed. So this is an example of a resource that has, um, it's in good condition, but it does have pretty poor integrity. Um, it's still important because of what it was and what it still is, but it does have poor integrity. Now we're going to dive into those kind of uh, sub-criteria. So there was a list of all of these nine factors that you have to evaluate for every historic resource decision that you're making. The first one is um, retention of original construction. So this is really getting at historic materials. And it's a pretty simple concept here. Keep and fix the historic materials, if at all possible. I also wanted to touch on um, the concept of the word original. The lower photograph is the Bickner building, which is um, uh, just downtown. You probably have all passed it a million times. And if you look closely at it, you'll see that it consists of a brick storefront pasted on to um, a, what was originally, when it was constructed, a hotel. So original, in this case, can also mean historic, but not necessarily present on day one. So 20 years elapsed between uh, when this resource had a brick storefront added to it and when it was first constructed um, in the early or 1870s, I believe. And um, so it's important to still retain, obviously, all of this resource, even the brick um, storefront that was added later because that aspect of it is still very much historic. The upper two images are showing the Johnson Barn, which um, is an example of a resource that has had some materials changed, but um, they've all been kind of patched and feathered in, in, to, in such a way that it all matches the original material, and there's quite a bit of original <coughs> material still left. Now, the next three slides, just to make sure you're awake, I'm going to go over the next two sub-criteria. So we're looking at both time period consistency, which is kind of criteria two, and then visual integrity and style, which is number three. And in order for me to talk to you about both time period consistency and visual integrity and style, I wanted to give you a little compare and contrast exercise in architectural styles. So what you're looking at is two different styles. The upper two images are showing craftsman style, and the lower two Im images are showing um, colonial revival style. And I'm going to give you some uh, distinctive features to look for in both of these styles, just so you can kind of follow along with what's distinctive about each of these styles. Now, Colonial Revival, which is again on the bottom, usually you're going to see roofs that are hipped. Um, craftsmen, 
usually you're going to see roofs that are gable. But this is not something that is so distinctive, it's always present. So that's why I said usually. Something that is more important about the roofs of both of these styles is that colonial revival roofs, now I'm going to see if I can use my, oops, I wanted to go back, Let's see if I can use the, there we go. Um, the important thing about craftsman roofs is that they are open underneath and you'll see exposed rafter tails, you'll see um, brackets, and you'll see um, you'll see uh, exposed eaves. Colonial Revival, you will never see any of that. The roofs extend horizontally back to the face of the building. So those are always distinctive features that you need to look for if you're trying to figure out the style of a building. Another distinctive feature about Colonial Revival resources is that they usually have a fairly small pedimented entry. And this occurs both at this lower left image here. You can kind of see that, that pedimented in entry, which is basically the triangle above the door. And then you can also see it clearly in this um, slide on the lower right, where again you see that pedimented entry. Now, craftsman style has no decor at the entry. It tends to be just a fairly simple rectangular door. Colonial Revival, porches are not common, where on craftsman resources, full width porches or at least large porches are very common. And then finally, Colonial Revival style um, usually has multi-paned windows, often in pairs. But in craftsman style resources, you can have quite a variety of window types and styles. They are often double hung, but not always. So just continuing on the next slide about styles a little bit, I wanted to show you um, a slide that shows timeline about um, popular styles of architecture in Oregon. And this is just because it, it, it's important to understand that styles do change over time. So what you're seeing um, in the sort of graph on the bottom is 15 year increments. And some of the styles that are represented on top, some of those individual styles such as, as here we go, such as Queen Anne, this one right here, which is one of the Victorian styles. This one actually lasted quite a bit longer than I'm showing, you know, <coughs> this timeline down here. But just for the sake of simplicity, um, these resources are generally kind of overlapping a little bit in styles. Styles tend to hang on, um, but then be superseded by the next group of styles. So now, the reason I showed you all that about stylistic concerns is because I'm going to give you a little quiz here, and this is a real life example that came in front of the historic uh, Landmarks Commission in Portland. So this is a resource you're looking at um, its existing um, facade on the left. And what this is, um, it's basically a colonial revival style duplex. And it's a contributing resource in the LADS edition historic district, if any of you know that district. I wanted to point out a few things about this resource because um, as I just spent a few minutes talking about, it is colonial revival in style. And so what you're seeing here are a few of those distinctive 
stylistic features. Most importantly, or most distinctively, I would say, is the entry. What you're seeing here is this very interesting <coughs> little bell curve open pediment entry. Um, you're also seeing those distinctive closed eaves that I mentioned on the resource. There are a few other things that make it obviously a colonial revival style, but what the applicant was proposing was a alteration to it which added a full width front porch. And the applicant said she um, felt like it was definitely something that all the other resources on her block had Incidentally, they were craftsman style. And she really wanted a porch. She felt like this was something that would give her much greater livability. And she had an architect design it. It actually um, was nicely designed. But the important thing to know about the comparison between those two styles that I went through earlier is that um, a a colonial revival style would never have a full-length porch, especially with open eaves and rafter tails. So what the alteration would have done is compromised the integrity, diminished the importance of this resource, especially since it was at the very front, you know, the, the front facade, which is typically a more important facade um, than the remainder um, sides or back of the house. So the next uh, criteria I'm going to move on to is number four, and that is replacement or addition materials. So there are going to be cases where a resource really, the, the original materials cannot be patched. Uh, they have to be replaced. So this criteria is really saying that if necessary to replace, the new materials should match the original structure in visual qualities. That doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the same material, but its visual qualities should match. What you're seeing here on the upper three images are um, the Lovejoy Fountain sequence, again in Portland, by Lawrence Halperin. And this is one of the little shelters next to uh, the Lovejoy Fountain, where the wood was deteriorating in the original support blocks. Um, it needed patching, but the problem was that the dimensional material was no longer available um, because wood, as many of you probably know, wood dimensions have changed over time. You can't buy two inch lumber and have it be two inches. So in order to maintain um, the exact uh, dimensions and spacing, the lumber to replace some of the deteriorated wood had to be specially milled. It did add cost, but the city was willing to put up that cost. The lower images show the uh, marble at the state capitol. And there was a fire in the, um, the governor's offices, and that heavily damaged some of the exterior marble and it had to be replaced. Luckily, the original quarry was still um, offering that marble, and the same exact marble could be sourced and put on the building. That was a lucky find. Um, criteria five is about building height. So, the examples I'm showing, first off, the top ones are from a historic district in Portland. The top left image is from a building that was actually demolished 
in a historic district. And then the upper right image shows what was, it's not constructed yet, but it's been approved to replace that, that resource. And the important thing is that the resource that replaced it, yes, it was slightly higher at two stories, but that height really matched um, the historic district around it. So it was compatible with its surroundings. The lower image I'm showing you is actually the same house. So what you're seeing on the lower left is an addition that was put onto a historic house. You don't see it at all from the front, which is the uh, lower right image. But although this is a very modern example, um, I am showing it to you just for the height criteria. Um, and this design is a good example of maintaining a building height with an example, so, or with an addition, excuse me. So that from the front, which is again, the probably the most important place you're gonna see and understand a resource, you don't see this addition at all. So the concept should really be of maintaining the primary, the primary or original volumes, roof and height. Okay, moving on to um, criterion six, which is about horizontal additions. And on the upper two slides, I'm deliberately showing a pretty contemporary horizontal addition. This is on the PSU campus in Portland. And this addition does face a major street. Um, this isn't necessarily the main entry, but it kind of functions as such. But the addition is really an insertion, and it is a limited scale insertion, which is the reason why it kind of works. Um, the insertion is respectful in every way, except for, in this case, the material. So this, the architects chose a very glassy addition, but they carried across some of the horizontality, the, the lines extending from the original building, and very importantly, they didn't exceed the height. So this is, again, horizontal addition. The lower image shows a design by another Portland architect, and this is the classic use of a kind of hyphen or joint between an original resource and an addition. So you can see that kind of joint helps to keep the primary resource understandable, um, and, it, and the primary part of it is really the part that uh, anybody would look at and understand um, even though it has an addition growing out of it. So that addition is kept sort of lightly touching the original resource. So in general, it's important to understand in this, in this criteria that compatibility should be a stronger factor in the design than differentiation. So criteria seven is about windows. So window replacements shall match the original windows in materials and appearance. The original number of window panes shall be maintained or restored when replacements are required. Windows can be a very difficult aspect to regulate. So cost can be a really big factor. So that is one piece that you're weighing. You also need to get pretty unbiased facts about wi whether windows are repairable. There will be applicants who come in and say, the condition is terrible, we need to take these out. And that's not necessarily always true. Um, so that's, this is sometimes um, one of those evaluation factors that you do need to ask staff for help in weighing 
the evaluation of whether the resources windows can be saved or not. Another myth that is often that you'll hear is that windows are a really big factor in energy performance for a building. And typically that's not actually true. Um, even for resources that have single pane windows, windows are not the biggest area of heat loss in a building. That is typically, you'll lose a lot through the walls and roof. So asking a, an applicant whether the walls and roof are, are insulated might be one of your questioning strategies. Um, but if you are uh, evaluating windows that are being replaced, then it's important to understand the visual qualities of the windows that are in front of you that are being proposed to go into the new resource. So some of those factors are going to be whether the window is inset into the wall the same amount. That can really change the visual qualities of a building because that's typically the first thing you see is the shadows of a building, how deep that shadow line is and how far the window is set back really creates those shadow lines. Another thing is the dimensions of the profile. So typically there's going to be some change, especially if you're moving from a resource that has steel windows that have very narrow profiles to something that has perhaps an aluminum window that might have slightly thicker profiles. But it's important to make sure that that doesn't create such a big difference in the look of the resource that its significance is impacted. <coughs> Another factor is um, those multi-pane windows. So typically it's, it's not feasible for applicants to come in with true multi-pane windows that are new because insulated windows have two panes of glass and you can't create a whole bunch of little multi-pane panes of, gla of insulated glass. So what people do is create um, a layer on the inside between the glass, which kind of looks like tape from the outside, unless the applicant also includes an exterior grid that's dimensional. So again, you want that shadow line, you want the same appearance, and you're looking for the same visual quality. Um, Criteria number eight is whether restoration is possible. And basically this is a pretty simple concept. It's really getting at whether the proposal is essentially additive. And in, if a proposal is adding something, it should be easy in future to take that off and have the resource be basically unimpaired. You might have to fill a few holes, but essentially nothing has really changed. So what you're seeing here in these images is um, a, a major commercial building that has gone through a series of different awnings at its base over time. So on the upper left, you see the original awnings that were the style where you could uh, crank it closed uh, then below that, you're seeing some more kind of 70s style curving uh, fabric awnings. And then the most recent and largest photo shows the awnings completely taken off. Um, and in each of these um, cases, the awnings were, were generally treated as fine, you know, whether or not you would like the awnings on your building, you know, that's kind of an owner decision, but make sure that um, if you remove them, that the resource can be returned to its original state. So finally, we've reached the last criteria, which is kind of the catch-all about signs, uh, lighting, and awnings. 
And the upper two images are showing um, just a single image each for appropriate lighting and awnings. So these are both taken from Portland's um, historic Chinatown, Japantown district, which has a lot of commercial buildings. So on the upper left, you're seeing an example of appropriate lighting, um, where the lighting really is about the building features. So you're not seeing um, sort of a big, long uh, rope of lighting that's, you know, goes all the way around the resource. Instead, the lighting is really highlighting what's important about the building, its features. Um, so in this case, the lighting um, is l highlighting a, the top of a pretty simple pilaster on the, uh, this brick building. Um, on the upper right, you're seeing an awning that is appropriately scaled, and um, you're still seeing the original transom windows above the awning. So this is, a, this is an example of an awning that is nicely designed to fit within a historic storefront. Now, on the lower two images, um, I wanted to talk about signs. And what you're seeing is the same resource um, in Lake Oswego. This is the uh, Rogers Building 1, I believe, um, just right a few blocks from here. And there are two images, one of which was taken back in 1960-something, and then uh, the one on the right, a much more contemporary version. And the image on the 60s, you'll see signs added to this building in quite a few locations. One of them is at the very pinnacle of the, um, the roof piece, which I would argue um, really detracts from the original qualities of you know, this kind of octagonal feature of the building. I mean, it's kind of cute, it's very kitsch, but it's certainly not original, and I would argue not very respectful. Another sign to talk about on that historic image is the wall sign that's applied across the, above the existing awning or canopy. And the sign isn't terrible in that it's, it's, um, it's generally where signs were supposed to be for this building, although I would argue it's sized um, that it kind of starts to cover up a few of the decorative features of the building. So if you look closely at the sign, you can see that uh, some of the um, or concrete plaster work is actually half covered by this sign. And then finally, there's a projecting sign on this building which um, again is perhaps not terrible. It's rather interesting and certainly of its time, but I would argue that it could be lowered and could be smaller to be more respectful on this historic building. So that essentially ends my presentation. I wanted to um, say a word here about preparing yourself ahead of time. And as commissioners, I'm sure that you spend long hours reading the staff report and looking at the resources that have been given to you. But in some cases, it is necessary to take the extra step. And I'm actually including on this slide a few extra resources for understanding styles, which you might want to do in certain cases, just to get back to some of those concepts of what really is appropriate for the style. Um, so the history and features of any single resource, of course, are going to be part of the inventory. So that's all available to you. Um, any resource on the landmark designation list um, I think there, again, we're 72, and, and the city has good information about those. But if you're not seeing information that you need to evaluate 
um, a proposal in front of you, you should raise that early with staff. Make sure they have the opportunity to go back to the applicant if needed. And some of those could be, for instance, those questions about whether or not windows could be salvaged. Do you have all the information you really need? Um, but in general, um, you, I know that you have done your homework, and um, it's a credit that uh, you are willing to make these difficult decisions and wade into um, historic aspects of land use. So I hope this has helped you make some of those decisions that are coming in front of you. So if you have questions, please fire them at me. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have questions? I need it. Kristen, I had a question about the awnings in the building uh, <coughs> taken in downtown Portland. Sure. Were those oh, striped, yep. striped awnings totally original with the building, or would it be better if, in like in the case of their new proposal, that probably the building didn't have awnings when it was first built? Um, the building had awnings within its first, I would say, 10 or 20 years of life. So I can't necessarily vouch that those awnings were added when the building was first constructed. Um, but I would say that the awnings are, um, they're, they're not necessarily um, something that have to be exactly carried into the, d the design of new awnings. So if, if an applicant wanted to um, add awnings now, they should have an option of styles um, as long as they were respectful of the, the bay divisions and the, um, the general storefront design of that building. And I had a question about the, the, I think it's the Rogers building in Lake Oswego. Oh, yeah. Probably those metal projecting awnings that hide all the interesting oh, yeah. architectural details, even though they're there in the 1966 right, right picture, were not originally good part of the point. building. They were not original. That is a good point. That awning, um, uh, I, I would suggest if somebody wanted to come in with a similar building and put in an awning, that it might be more respectful to actually look at dividing that awning into a, a, a more storefront bay division as the building is, since well, it is has it, those individual storefronts. Would it be appropriate to encourage the, if, if the owner was coming in to do something significant with this building, to restore the uh, barrel tile roof and the uh, the original spindle <coughs> details that used to be between the cast concrete details at the top of those pilasters. I mean, is that how far do you go with something like this? Yeah, that's a great question. Typically, um, you would want a resource to certainly get no worse under your, your decision, right? So if an applicant is coming in with a certain package of changes, then you can ask them if they're willing to make some changes, but they shouldn't be asked to necessarily make changes to, um, to get a building all the way back to its original um, style or design. Uh, if they want to do that, or if they're proposing something that gets them closer to that, I think you can certainly push them in that direction. But asking them to visit something that they hadn't anticipated looking at, such as a roof, if they're just proposing awnings, um, might entail extreme costs for them. I mean, it's kind of out of, um, out of the pale for reasonable decision-making, I would say. 
Sure. I have a question. Uh, Kristen, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is about, <clears throat> and from the architecture that, that we run into uh, that uh, is historic, uh, one of the major problems is structure. That, I mean, a lot of these buildings are brick, and we have ever increasing structural codes. Isn't that right, David? <laughs> the, um, at what point do you, um, how do you determine that? Because uh, I've looked at some buildings that have these huge cross braces, you know, that, that are historic in nature, that uh, the cross bracing practically takes over the, uh, the styling. All of a sudden, it becomes a modern building as opposed to a historic building. That's a quote, great question. Quote, you know. And I'm just going to go back to windows just, just because they're a little bit related. Um, seismic upgrades are critical to be able to use a building. So um, no restoration is going to be effective if you know it, it doesn't allow the use of the building. Or I guess I didn't put, phrase that very well. If a building can't be used because of its uh, instability, then that's not preservation. But the key is, as you noted, how to make that structural system or um, improvement respectful of the historic features and materials of the building. So what you would want to encourage a structural engineer to do is tell you about <coughs> different ways they could do this. And indeed, one of those ways is steel cross bracing. Steel cross bracing um, can be used on the interior, of course, which makes it far better than on the exterior. Um, and a system which might even be better in certain cases, if it's possible, is using a concrete frame inside which can be held away from the windows. That's not always feasible, but I think what you're looking at, looking for, is the best system that allows the least changes to the exterior of the building. Um. Okay, I have one other question, kind of a follow-up question. Sure. I was touring a historical remodel this week, <clears throat> and I was walking through the building with a contractor, and inside the building, they had stripped away all of the finishes. And inside the building, there was this uh, brick wall. And I said, oh, good, you know, that'll be historic. He says, well, it's not historic because we've got to cover it up. It, because it wasn't part of the original intent, which I thought was kind of interesting. But if you carry that one step further, well, what is original? I mean, if you're covering something up and making it look like the original, that's really not original either, you know, yeah. so, in a lot of ways. So I was just curious about your comments about that. Yeah, that, um, that, idea. that question brings up um, a point that I probably should have made initially in this presentation, which I apologize for not covering, and that is um, exterior changes versus interior changes. <laughs> so the city doesn't regulate interior changes, but the state does if something is uh, listed on the National Register and if somebody is trying to use incentives such as tax, um, historic tax incentives. So the owner that you talked to was probably trying to go for either Oregon Special Assessment or historic tax credits. And under those programs, you really do have to um, keep the interior level of finishes similar to what they would have been uh, when the building was originally designed. That's not something that you'll need to worry about for your reviews, but because as I said, the city only regulates the exteriors of buildings. Um, yeah. that. Is that including the floor plan? The city only is concerned about the exterior facade? Correct, Sorry. the exterior, and that does include the roof, but it doesn't include you know, the floor plan or the finishes inside. 
Thank you. I have a question. Um, can we go back and there's that one uh, picture of that glass structure on the back side. It wasn't part of the, the frontage. Oh, I knew somebody was going to go back to that. Okay. There you go. Um, yeah. The one, the lower left. Yes. In, now, I, I'm not really have any specific questions about this one. Okay. But it was one that stuck out in my mind is uh, how much at hazard I feel making these decisions. Okay. <laughs> because if my job is to interpret the code... Yeah. And and you have to admit most of the things that you've discussed today <laughs> don't appear to be quantifiable to any demonstrative degree. That's right. Uh, they are all aspirational, you know. <clears throat> and uh, from the land use perspective, those things are always uh, difficult for us to to determine. And this one was a particular one for me because if it was just up to me and I looked at it, I'd say, okay. It really doesn't match the front architectural style whatsoever. You're, if you want to make an argument that it does from it, you know, you can't see it from the street or it's the back of the building and all that. To me, it just sounds like one big rationalization. And so I would, my gut, I'm just being honest, my gut reaction would be to deny this just from that perspective that it just doesn't, you know, gut feel 10,000 feet away. Yeah. That doesn't work. Okay. So my point in my little speech here is that I would really like whenever we have something from the city, a, a proposal in front of us, to have the city retain their own SHPO expert or, you know, a historical expert. So that I can at least hear yeah. a balanced opinion from both sides because I'm, you know, just quite honestly, I just don't feel qualified because of what I would look at that one. That's just the example. And my gut feel would say, no. Yeah. Well, I'm going to agree with you. Um, in your shoes, I'm probably not going to be approving this addition, um, even though it's in the back. Um, it's just, for me, it's really not compatible enough. So you are going to be I guess in some cases you're hearing from the HRAB, correct, Paul? Yes. Okay. And even when you're not hearing from the HRAB on a certain case, um, staff is always going to be a resource for you. Um, there are certain <coughs> reasons, you know, just criteria that you might be able to check off. And in fact, that's kind of why I showed this image. This could meet height i think you know this could be conceivably fine this this meets that criteria that one criteria there are other criteria though that i would agree with you this addition doesn't meet well height is quantifiable that's why that you know i, I feel comfortable reviewing right. things against those types of things right <clears throat> okay that, that's all i had any other questions None. Should we open up to questions from those from the Planning Commission and the Historic Resource Board? I have no questions. Thank you. I appreciate the presentation. Did, Good. Can you guys come up to the mic if, if you have any questions so people watching at home can hear too? I think he said he doesn't. Oh, he doesn't have any questions? Okay. So I don't see any questions then? Well, one of the things that I, because I've been through a few of these in my six and a half years on on the commission and what I found really helpful was when we were able to do a, a site visit like we broke it up into two so we didn't have a quorum at any given time when we did the site visit but that was really helpful it was one of the homes on the lake uh, so I think uh, in those cases where you want to get up close and and and, and view things and maybe have um, you know someone from staff kind of point out the things that that are are critical for our review that that's very helpful and I think that would be good to do up front as opposed to, in that case, I think we continued the hearing and then went on the site visit. So. Yeah, good point. That's a, that's a great um, it, uh, way to get yourself informed, yeah. I have another question. What about color? You know, you could have the same design, but it could be a radically different look. 
with yeah. color. How is is there is color a historic aspect? It wasn't one of your nine topics. I'm going to let you. Yeah, yeah. It's as far as I understand, color is not regulated unless it's intrinsic to the material. So, for instance, you have red brick on a building. <coughs> you can't then add paint to it without a review. Is that correct? Oh, good. Does that make sense? So changing paint color, totally outside your purview, but changing the coating or material, you know, uh, so in other words, adding color to something that is intrinsically colored, that is within your review. So if you had brick, you could paint it. I mean, the owner. No, no, not without a review. Just because brick is an intrinsic material and um, it's typically not painted, and there are good reasons for that. Well, if it if if it was painted before, hypothetically, before it came, then yes. you could change the color. Correct. Through. So then the applicant could change the color without any review or right. Okay. Um, can I say one other thing? Sure. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I wanted to go back. Nick, to your uh, seismic question, um, you know, if if we if we didn't have a particular building code provision, then any time you even touch the building, you'd have to bring the whole building up to current seismic standards. But there are provisions in the code that allow you to analyze, um, you know, if you make a modification and what that modification impacts. And as part of the existing structure. If the load that you put on the modification is, you know, it, it varies a little bit, but 5% is kind of the number. If it, if it impacts that adjacent existing member by 5% or more, then you have to analyze it for seismic. If it's 5% or less, then you can probably leave it alone. And that might be an interesting um, way to look at a building because you may decide to not touch something <clears throat> because it would bring that whole upgrade and the upgrade would in fact um, jeopardize the whole historical nature of the building. Of course, you know, we also, you know, as an engineer, right, first and foremost is public health and safety, so we have to look at that whole equation. But, uh, but I think it's interesting to understand how the code works in that, in that regard. That's all I had to say. Five percent is not very much. I mean, that's that's a. Uh, it's not. If so, you're saying if the if the say this brick facade is five percent structurally uh, indeterminate or, or you know non-compliant with the code, it has to be reinforced. Is that what you're saying? If what you were, if the modification you're proposing impacts that existing element of the building, structural element of the building by 5% or more, then you must look at that existing member from a seismic current code perspective. If it's less than 5%, then it's, you may, you may have the option of not. It just depends upon how we look at it from a, a complete safety perspective. <clears throat> if it wasn't for that, then any modification anybody ever made to any building would, would not really be affordable because we couldn't just upgrade everything to the, the full seismic standards. <clears throat> and I will point out that um, the code offers a few areas um, of, I guess, um, uh, allowing historic buildings to not necessarily be brought up to code. You know, it, it can be rather <laughs> limited areas things like ADA typically you have to meet. Um, but, but there can be other aspects, for instance, um, um, not entirely meeting lighting standards or, you know, there, there are a few other things. So it's always good to understand that there are allowances for historic buildings in the code. Okay. Any final uh, questions or thoughts? Well, any, I, I was going to 
maybe disagree with you a little bit on the window comment that the windows do not affect the energy uh, aspects of the building. I think they do. They are, you know, very, very much so. And uh, windows comprise you know, a huge or comprise a huge area of the of the, of the building itself. Well, our 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 office does a lot of envelope studies of historic buildings and typically the insulation in the walls and roof is is a, a, a much larger factor um, unless you have a building that really does have quite a lot of glass area I mean historic buildings often have I guess smaller glass area compared to wall area so I will say that okay we, we, we agree to disagree <laughs> perhaps <laughs> We can talk about that later. <laughs> so, thank you. Chris, and with that technique of the so-called simulated divided light yeah. that you described, uh, those uh, Munton widths and all those profiles can be matched with uh, in, in any number of good manufacturers, and those, I would presume, would be all acceptable alternatives to uh, if you can't re uh, restore <coughs> the windows pretty hard to double glaze some of the old wooden windows, but you can end up with a window that looks exactly the same or almost exactly the same. Is that an acceptable? Oh, absolutely. You're looking for those similar visual qualities again in the windows. So yes, that's a, that's a great um, alternative is using the, the grids. And there are some steel, manuf steel window manufacturers now that are coming online they're just super super expensive but they're available yeah can be insulated yeah yeah but that's not something you can you can't force somebody to use a product like that I, I guess if uh, can you um, I mean again you're you're weighing the importance of the resource and the cost to the applicant so um, if an applicant comes in and they actually want to use that product, great. You, you don't have to push them anywhere. If they're coming in and they're saying, you know, we, you know, we have this sort of nice resource. It's of local significance and I really don't have the money to buy all new steel windows. Can I use these nice aluminum windows? They have, okay, you know, they're another half an inch wider profile, but I can do you know, similar divisions. And I think you could probably find that that was a pretty good, acceptable window. It's, it's probably fair to ask them, though, to show you the numbers or something like that. Then if they haven't explored the resources at all, yeah, which some I people would, don't do. I would definitely ask for some evidence. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Uh, in the same subject for a window that yeah. uh, uh, for non-insulated uh, you know windows that there is a big heat loss from from the window yeah. and we know that it's important that historical building they are limiting uh, to change that window so is there any uh, example you have seen that Somebody suggests that we put a uh, insulated double glazed window matching with uh, uh, with the window from inside, basically two windows, and um, we maintain the uh, the exterior, but we put a new one inside. Have you seen any cases like that? Yes, I have. Um. <coughs> Uh, I am not going to be able to come up with the name of the, oh, well, Indo Window is one, but I can't think of a building that he could look at for that. Um, right, so, so um, we're talking about the internal storm windows, Indo Window and things like that. Yes. Um, to preserve the existing and but in addition you know to make it right yeah. we add a matching window from inside yeah i actually know of a case where the windows were all this is a commercial building where the windows were all taken out old big wood windows mm -hmm. and um 
they were routed to accept an additional pane of glass on the inside, and then the windows were all reinstalled. It was a very uh, laborious process, but the owner was uh, committed to doing that. And I'm going to find the name of that building and send it to you, or send Thank it you. to staff to yeah. share with you. Thank you. What you're describing, though, is not a sealed unit. Sounds Correct. Like. So it has to Correct. be breathable. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have seen those systems where a piece of plate glass is put inside, so you're not trying to replicate the mullions and muttons, but uh, leaving about a quarter of an inch all the way around and letting it breathe. Yeah. It gives you almost the insulation <coughs> value that you'd get with a double glazed, maybe even more because you have a bit wider airspace. Uh, I was actually thinking that the window that you had from inside would be sealed and, you know, in order <coughs> to protect you know, uh, the heat loss. Uh, yeah, yeah but you, could, you could bring the dew point inside between the two and that's a... But from outside, probably should be some kind of <coughs> system that can be <coughs> and, uh, you know, avoid condensation or any other issue. Yeah. But I've heard of that. That's, uh, that's why I came up with the question. Mm -hmm. I've heard uh, okay. about that uh, you know, kind of design before. I, I have a question for staff. Is there a place where we can see a listing of all of these uh, buildings that are historic that are subject to these regulations? Yes, there is a full list of all the historic landmarks in the city in the code. And I. I'd be happy to forward you that list. It has all the addresses and the names of the of the landmarks or buildings. Okay, and any of the property owners, if they're not aware, <laughs> they can find it there as well. Right. Yeah. But they should all be, yeah, they're all aware. They're, they are now. <laughs> okay. Yes, please, come on. Uh, Chair, commissioners, uh, I just wanted to, well, I. On behalf of staff, this presentation was initiated by staff, but I wanted to encourage the commission if there are particular topics that, that we can bring to you, if there are training sessions or tours that you'd like uh, for us to help facilitate, we're uh, you know, within the capacity and staff limitations that we have, we're happy to do that. The planning commission has been very active in uh, touring neighborhoods and they've had uh, training sessions on, there was one on uh, traffic engineering and safety and so uh, we realize you're all busy and you're volunteers but we, we hope that if we can offer some of this as enrichment or continuing education it'll help you do your jobs uh, and and you know add value to the process um, also want to just add finally that the um, the inventory of landmarks is also online and uh, the profile sheets for each property are available there as well um, the city through uh, our historic preservation program does reach out to um, the owners of landmark properties um, i think it's annually yes. uh, we we do send out a letter letting them know that you know if the properties change hands it's an opportunity to get acquainted um, for some properties they've they've opted to you know receive a plaque that identifies it as an historic landmark so it's an ongoing process and, and community outreach and education so one question is there a historic district it's there's just, there's just, no just uh, individual yeah. buildings individual buildings there isn't a, a district in the city at this point yeah. okay well I appreciate the the, the time to uh, bring us up to speed on on that uh, I think if we do have another uh, application uh, this will certainly help us and this has been recorded so it'll be available online and and uh, so that that's always there so thank you thank you Okay, if there's no other business, we will adjourn the meeting.